communism is a stateless, moneyless, classless society where the workers collectively own the means of production. There's no private property or capital accumulation. There's a socialist mode of production and an abolition of commodities. The first country to attempt communism was the Soviet Union after a revolution which at the end of the day had Vladimir Lenin in charge of the country. From that point on, other countries decided to take on the initiative to achieve communism, specifically a Marxist variant of communism. Countries such as Cuba, Albania, China, Burkina Faso, Vietnam, among many others had communist revolutions or in some way got communists into power. In this video, I want to discuss these countries and how they fared, and I also want to make critiques of communism that I find legitimate and backed by evidence. No. To make this video brief, I will only go over socialist countries that are well known and that I believe I have the knowledge to cover. Some leftists will make the argument that actually these countries such as the USSR, Cuba, and Maoist China were good. They argue that the historical consensus on these countries, which consider these countries authoritarian hellholes that failed miserably, to simply be propaganda created by the bourgeoisie. In reality, they are the ones committing historical revisionism and at worst, genocide denial. I'll go over a few select countries and discuss life in these countries, as well as bring up case studies that I think are fair to decide which is better between socialism and capitalism. Life in the Soviet Union, despite what some leftists will try to tell you, was a terrible place to live in. There was rampant authoritarianism and human rights violations, genocide and famine. There was also large amounts of poverty and a lower standard of living compared to other countries. According to the National Council for Soviet and East European Research, things like healthcare and housing were incredibly stratified and poverty was rampant. Quote, well, like any other nation, the Soviet Union contains many poor people. But the Soviet poverty sector is surprisingly large given the Soviet government's concern with its image as a socialist welfare state. Using Soviet estimates of minimum family income requirements, it appears that the average family in 1965 existed in a state of poverty. A large number of surveys conducted during the 1960s revealed that as many as a quarter or a third of the urban working class lived below the poverty line. And since rural wages are about 10% lower than urban wages, and rural inhabitants account for 35% of the Soviet population, the total number of poor people in the Soviet Union was perhaps 40% of the entire population. Although industrial workers are among the best paid in Soviet society, available statistics indicate that almost a third of them do not rise above the poverty threshold. One can assume the situation must be considerably worse for the 30 million people employed in healthcare and education and the 40 million workers employed in unmechanized production jobs. Among the other massive failures of the USSR came the large amount of alcoholism and of alcohol abuse among its citizens. Quote, Another important medical and social problem in the Soviet Union is the increasing degree of alcohol abuse and alcoholism. The magnitude and severity of this phenomenon are unique in terms of the international experience. Soviet consumers drink over 17 liters of pure alcohol equivalent to pure per person each year. And the Soviet Union ranks first in the world regarding per capita consumption of strong alcohol beverages such as vodka. More strikingly, Soviet consumption of hard liquors has increased by approximately 4.5% a year over the last 25 years. According to numerous Soviet studies, heavy drinking is an important factor in contributing to the overall mortality rates in the Soviet Union, and the number of deaths attributed to acute alcohol poisoning was an estimated at over 50,000 in 1978. Soviet economists have also estimated that alcohol abuse decreased Soviet labor productivity by about 10% during the early 1970s. Between 16 and 18 million Soviet citizens were confined to overnight sobering up stations in 1979 alone. But since the government depends on alcohol for a large share of its budgetary revenues, alcoholic beverages are one of the few consumer items that are continually available in the Soviet Union. As well as economic hardship, the USSR is also an authoritarian regime that committed a wide range of atrocities against its own people. From the Holodomor or genocide which led to about 4 million deaths, the famine and political repression such as the Great Purge, the incompetence of the USSR to feed its own people as well as the political repression and genocide puts the death count in the USSR to at least 11 million deaths. Sources will be in the description for people who want to learn more. In this section of the video, I will be going over the biggest misconception that leftists, mainly pro-USSR leftists, have about life in the Soviet Union. This will include certain debunks of certain common talking points as well as other things. The answer to this question is, not really. It depends on how you ask the question. 
as some polls have found that most Russians miss the Soviet Union, but when asked if they wanted to return to the path that the USSR was following, only 28% said yes. In addition, in most of the former Soviet satellite states and former Soviet states, a vast majority of them said that the 1989-1991 reforms have had a good influence on standard of living, as well as a vast majority of people saying they agree with a multi-party system and a market economy. The answer to this is no. Stalin and his policies were not necessary for Russia's economic development according to NBER, and that standard of living increased during the NEP, a market-based system implemented by Lenin temporarily according to the Journal of Libertarian Studies, sources in the description. In addition, Soviet GDP growth was poor even when compared to poorer nations according to Nintel. The study also states, quote, we started this paper with a question, was Stalin necessary for Russia's economic development? In short, our answer is a definitive no. A czarist economy, even in our conservative version, assuming that it would not experience any decline in frictions, would have achieved a rather similar structure of the economy and levels of production as Stalin's economy by 1940. As I said before, Soviet healthcare was highly stratified and only a minority of people got quality healthcare. Quote, Healthcare in the Soviet Union is also highly stratified, and the best medical care is typically reserved for a privileged few. The Soviet medical system is divided into a series of networks which serve different segments of the population according to one's position in the Soviet society. Special clinics and hospitals exist throughout the Soviet Union for the benefit of the elites, while most Soviet citizens must make do with the much lower quality general healthcare system. While the Soviet Union is the largest number of hospital beds per capita in the world, the medical system is over-bureaucratized and routinized, and is plagued by chronic shortages of most healthcare materials, from high technology equipment to bandages. These shortages stem from continued underinvestment in the healthcare sector, as illustrated by the fact that the Soviet proportion of GMP allotted to healthcare is only one-third of the American level. Furthermore, Soviet spending on healthcare has declined significantly since the early 1970s, and some observers have linked this trend to a general degradation of the Soviet medical system, as indicated by rising infant mortality rates and death rates. Communists will often point to a CIA document that says that the average Soviet citizen ate just as many calories as American citizens. The problem with this is that it is just a very brief press release by Reuters about a CIA report rather than the report itself. Measuring diets at one point of production is a somewhat valid method of analysis because it is far simpler than trying to measure an actual point of consumption. Care does need to be taken though in a system like the Soviets where there can be very significant losses in food and transportation and storage. The full report tries to take into consideration farm losses but acknowledges that these later losses in the food chain are unaccounted for. The discrepancy is basically, basically that the linked document is not a CIA report, it isn't a CIA analysis or CIA research, it is a newswire. People are generally aware that news reporting on scientific papers is notoriously flawed. I don't think this is much different. If the linked document was written by the CIA at all, it was probably written by their media team, not the actual researchers themselves. An important thing to note is that even if you adjust the Soviet diet significantly downwards, they weren't starving outside of the three famine periods and World War II sieges. I'm saying they ate 2,800 calories or something, not 3,200. It is actually really quite hard for starvation events to occur. Mass starvation is not terribly common in Russian history. The Romanovs saw one mass starvation event in their entire 300-year reign. The fact that the Bolsheviks oversaw, oversaw three in 30 years is astonishing. So Soviets weren't going hungry from the 1950s onwards. Their nutrition wasn't great, especially when you look at the huge variances between regions. A lot of the CIA analysis was overly rosy and the Soviet figures were almost always inflated. Even small things can make comparisons hard, like the definition of meat by the Soviets included awful, but we're talking less nourished, not starving or even really malnourished in this period. The answer is, for the majority of countries, yes. In most of the former Warsaw Pact states and former Soviet states, Life expectancy grew rapidly as well as the country's human development indexes, GDP per capita, and GNI per capita. The graphs will be shown on screen here. In this section, I'll be going over the inefficiencies of the Maoist system and the large amount of repression, starvation, and inefficiencies that happened in the country during Mao's rule.
According to two NBER studies, China's poverty in 1980 is attributed to Mao's policies that began in 1950. It took around 10 to 20 years for post reform China to make it up for the lost ground economically. In addition, Mao's policy showed slower growth rates compared to the post reform policies under Deng. The Great Leap Forward was a famine in Mao's China that, according to Frank Decoder, had killed around 45 million people, including at least 2.5 million victims who were beaten or tortured to death. A study by Cato found that 16 million babies should have been born from 1959 to 1961 if not for the famine. According to a study by the Journal of Health Economics, the Great Leap Forward had major long-term effects on health and economic development, which led to a reduced population height and a negative impact on labor supply and earnings of famine survivors. The intro would be yes. However, first vice chairman of the CCP, Liu Xiaoqi, admitted that 70% of the famine was man-made, so this doesn't exonerate Mao from any blame. About 2.5 million of the victims were tortured or beaten to death. An example of this would be somebody tried stealing some food. Liu Dishang, guilty of poaching a sweet potato, was covered in urine. He, his wife, and his son were also forced into a heap of excrement. Then Tong Zhu used to pry his mouth open after he refused to swallow excrement. He died three weeks later. The total amount of deaths that happened under Mao totaled up to around 82 million people. Given the Great Leap Forward, which killed 45 million people, the Cultural Revolution, which killed 20 million people, the Lao Gai Cancer, which killed 15 million people, the Chinese land reforms, which killed 800,000 people, and the purges of counter revolutionaries, which killed 712,000 people, the total number of deaths comes up at an estimated number of 82 million people. In 1981, just three years after Deng's capitalist reforms, almost 90% of Chinese people live in extreme poverty. That number has dropped to less than 0.7%, a stark contrast to the constant death and impoverishment suffered during the Great Leap Forward. Fidel Castro took power in Cuba in 1959 via a revolution against the former military dictator Fulgencio Batista. In this section, we will be talking about the repression that occurred under the Castro regime and the economic failures as well as critiques of their healthcare system. The Cuban economy post-revolution under Fidel Castro was an overall failure. Pre-revolution, all indicators were that Cuba was once a prosperous middle-income country that slipped down to world income distribution after the revolution. As far as we can tell, current levels of income per capita are below that of pre-revolutionary peaks, according to the Journal of Economic History. In addition, according to the Council of Economic Advisors, the gross national income of Cuba has fallen almost two-thirds relative to Puerto Rico by 2000. Another problem with the Cuban economy under Fidel is the agriculture produ agricultural production after nationalization. When about 70% of farmland was nationalized, production of livestock fell between 14% fish and 84% pork among the major crops. Production fell between 5% rice and 75% malanga. They avoided a famine because of Soviet assistance and immigration. Some leftists, on the other hand, will point to the Cuban embargo as a reason why Cuba failed. This would be a bad argument. According to the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy, U.S. economic sanctions against Cuba had a minimal overall historical impact on the Cuban economy. In addition, most economists agree that Cuba's economic downturn is more due to Cuba than to America, according to the Initiative on Global Markets. Fidel's Cuba was an absolutely brutal regime. According to the Miami Herald, firing squads killed around 5,700 people, extrajudicial killings killed around 1,200, imprisoned deaths another 1,200, giving us a total figure of around 8,100 total deaths from brutal repression in Cuba. The Cuban healthcare system, while it may look good on paper, violates basic human rights in order to skew their statistics possible mischaracterizations occurring as well according to health policy and planning. Quote, as stated by the authors of the commentary under discussion, the economist Roberto Gonzalez recently questioned the validity of infant mortality rates in Cuba, which stands at 4.1 per 1,000 live births, lower than the average for high-income countries, which is 5. The problem with this figure is that late fetal deaths, LFDs, deaths occurring after 28 completed weeks of gestation and over, appear to be abnormally high in Cuba compared with other countries, while early neonatal deaths, ENDs, deaths occurring in the first week of life, 
appeared to be abnormally low. According to Gonzalez, Cuban health authorities may be misclassifying ENDs as LFDs. If correct, Cuba's infant mortality rate could be at least twice as high as the infant mortality rate presented by the Cuban Ministry of Health, still lower than that of most middle-income countries, but not lower than that of high-income countries, and very probably higher than that of Chile, 7, and Costa Rica, 8. In addition, quote, finally, there is a problem of improving health through the use of mechanisms that violate basic rights. In addition to the forceful internment of women with high-risk pregnancies in state clinics and the performance of abortions without the clear consent of the mother discussed by the authors of Cuba Infant Mortality and Longevity, Healthcare or Repression, who can mention the compulsory seclusion in the late 1980s of individuals living with HIV in sanitariums, guarded by military personnel to control the HIV-AIDS epidemic, the goal is accomplished. Cuba is one of the lowest HIV adult prevalence rates worldwide. However, it is also the single place in the world where HIV detection tests are obligatory and where, until recently, people living with HIV were confined. More examples of the limited civil rights and denial of human rights relating to healthcare comes from health systems and reform, where they say that health policies in Cuba in the past half century have been implemented with limited concern for civil liberties and certain human rights such as the persecution of Cuban analysts who questioned the official version of the socioeconomic situation of pre-revolutionary Cuba, including the health state of affairs, the harassment and segregation of gays and people living with HIV, and the violation of labor rights of Cuban physicians working in international missions. Health policy and planning also points out that Cuban health statistics are flawed, and its health, health achievements are in large part due to repressive methods and unrelated to its actual health care. All sources will be in the description for everyone to read. In this section, I will go over the economic calculation problem and debunk certain popular responses to the problem. For people who are not aware of what the economic calculation problem is, it basically states that without a proper pricing system, you cannot properly allocate factors of production that best suit the subjective values of consumers. If a system is not allocatively efficient, it by definition fails to meet the basic needs of people. If you do not know what people want and how much of it to produce, then how can you say that your system is preferable to capitalism? Socialists cannot say that their system gives everyone health care, feeds them, houses them without specifically knowing what they want and how much of it to produce. Credit to Alex Popovic, who wrote a very good article on responses to the ECP that I will link in the description of this video. Linear programming misses the point of the economic calculation problem. Linear programming is simply a method we, th we could use to maximize or minimize material costs and outputs. The problem deals with how we establish a quantitative relationship between different factors of production, and by what common denominator we can use to do this. Linear programming does not do this. For example, linear programming could tell us how using more x instead of y would affect output. It cannot tell us whether we should use x or y in a dynamic economy. Many people have based their solutions to the calculation problem based on labor hours. This response falls flat in its face since it fails to consider that labor by nature is heterogeneous, not homogeneous. Say a doctor spends one hour of labor performing brain surgery. Let the value of that labor be represented by Y. Now let's say a doctor spends one hour of labor dropping off food for Uber Eats. Let that value be represented by X. We know that X does not equal Y, and we know this because of the previously mentioned fact regarding the heterogeneous nature of labor. Labor being heterogeneous matters because it means it cannot be used as a common denominator to commensurate different factors of production. Labor hours can only be effective at solving the ECP if planners could establish some interpersonal utility function, which is of course impossible. Given the subjective nature of value, one would need to determine how much each, each subject values each service such product and be able to compare the utility interpersonally. It is a popular view that Oscar Lange disproved Mises' calculation problem. This could not be further from the truth. To start, Lange's model is a neoclassical model. Like all neoclassical models, it presupposes a homogeneous capital structure and views it as one big blob. In reality, capital is heterogeneous. Capital is the most relevant factor of production in terms of the ECP, in which you must determine which capital goods to use in the production process. Even if the te technological information of production functions, the curves that represent the physical output possibilities of various inputs could be communicated to the central planner, this would be far from helping him produce economically. 
you would need he would not need to know the curves that represent that physical output, but which production method to pick out of a myriad of ways to produce a commodity. Let's say a product that is worth $50 can be produced by 5 units of A, 6 units of B, and 3 units of C, or by 2 units of A, 8 units of B, and 4 units of C. In a proper market economy, we can see that if the price of A is higher relative to the price of B and C, the second method of production will be less costly. The planner lacks this information because there is no market for goods A, B, and C. Even this would not be enough. Once it is known which one of the methods of production is cheaper, there remains the problem of how much to produce of each good with any given method. Given that prices of goods diminish as their supply increases, entrepreneurs can estimate if the number in the number of goods produced with more factors of production will yield a higher profit. These types of estimations and calculations are only possible at real market prices. Lange's solution is not very different from Taylor's original trial and error method. The parametric prices will be adjusted using the trial and error method. If the demand for some production goods exceeds the supply, parametric prices are increased. If the supply exceeds demand, prices are lowered to clear the market. The overall trial and error ideas are very flawed. We cannot look at previous supply and demand levels and say that we can formulate a proper price system based on those. Economies are ever changing, so relying on historical prices and demand levels is useless. If we have no market prices, we cannot determine if we are producing efficiently or inefficiently or if we're making a profit or a loss. The concept of trial and error is pointless if we cannot determine these in the first place. To add on, Ludwig von Mises himself critiqued the trial and error method in human action. He writes, quote, The method of trial and error is applicable in all cases in which the correct solution is recognizable as such by unmistakable marks not dependent on the method of trial and error itself. Things are quite different if only the mark of the correct solution is that it has been reached by the application of a method considered appropriate for the solution of the problem. The correct result of a multiplication of factors is recognizable only as a result of a correct application of the process indicated by arithmetic. One may try to guess the correct result by trial and error, but here, the method of trial and error is no substitute for the arithmetical process. It would be quite futile if the arithmetical process did not provide a yardstick for discriminating what is incorrect from what is correct. If one wants to call entrepreneurial action an application of the method of trial and error, one must not forget that the correct solution is easily recognizable as such. It is the emergence of a surplus of proceeds over costs. Profit tells the entrepreneur that the consumers approve of his ventures, loss that they disapprove. The problem of socialist e economic calculation is precisely this, that in the absence of market prices for the factors of production, a computation of profit or loss is not feasible. As we can see, the Lange model of all trial and error methods are flawed. Many people argue that previously centrally planned economies get past the ECP and that, in fact, Walmart currently does since it is as big as a centrally planned economy. This is quite a joke. The ECP is about production, not distributing goods. Walmart is a merchandising business, not a manufacturing one, meaning they don't produce their goods. Participatory economics proposes a system in which the planners communicate with the participating individuals, supposedly ones living in a commune together, to coordinate and meet the needs slash wants of the people. The issue here is that the ECP deals with allocating the factors of production. It does not deal with the distribu distribution of goods and services. Even under an economy that utilizes participatory economics, central planners could not determine how to allocate these factors of production rationally without a market-based pricing system. Having your planner work for profit does not debunk the ECP, no matter the motive and mode of distribution. It runs into the same question as the original ECP and is a straw man of what it is saying. It incorrectly assumes the ECP says that without a market you can't distribute goods. That's not what the ECP says at all. We have previously established what the ECP actually is and it still runs into the same issues. Many people argue that the ECP applies to capitalism. This is a completely foolish claim that stems from people not knowing what the ECP is. The ECP applies to planned economies because they do not have prices that act as a common denominator to allow us to commensurate different factors of production. In a centrally planned economy, prices cannot form for these higher order goods. Thus, economic calculation is not possible. In a market system, these prices do exist. Therefore, the ECP does not apply.
I hope I have adequately gone over socialism's failures in practice and why it wouldn't even be good in theory. I hope you have all enjoyed this video.